So a couple of things about Laodicea, and this is probably, um, uh, some of these messages obviously have been easier to give than others, and, and there's always the part at the end of tremendous in, encouragement because of the compensation that awaits us someday in heaven. Uh, this one, uh, the church of Laodicea, and we've, we've looked on a map, these churches are pretty close together in terms of, uh, of proximity. Uh, it's only about 40 miles southwest of, uh, of Philadelphia, the church we looked at last week that's just on fire for the Lord. We might say it's the mission-sending, commission-filling uh, church. Uh, and just 40 miles down the road, you've got the church of Laodicea that Jesus says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm not sure if you follow that. That means rejection. And, uh, and, there's, and there's some reasons for it. It's, it's, in a sense, it's kind of a frightening passage, a frightening exhortation. Uh, the fact that there could be people, Jesus says, I know your works. I know everything that you're doing. Uh, but, and I'm totally rejecting everything that you're doing. So these are folks that went to church on a regular basis, sat in church on a regular basis, said that they believed all the right things, and they were, going to be, they were being totally rejected by, by Jesus Christ. Uh, I remember reading a number of years ago, Luther said that, uh, that if people could um, get to heaven by doing good works, there'd be a lot of mules in heaven. Of course, in his day, the mules did all the plowing. They did all the work. Nobody, as far as he's concerned, nobody worked harder than a mule, so... Uh, if you could get to heaven by works, then be a lot of mules in heaven. He also said that uh, if you could get to heaven by simply attending church, there's going to be a lot of dogs in heaven. So apparently in that day, you know, that was the, uh, the dogs hung out on the front porches of the churches. The, you know, it was a stone area and probably cool and everything and always lots of dogs. They were always there. So if just being at church could get you to heaven, he said there'll be a lot of dogs in heaven. Uh, but obviously, that's not how we get to heaven. Keith Green later, I, I'm assuming, had read that from Luther and picked up on it and, and said that um, if going to church can make you a Christian, then going to McDonald's will make you a hamburger. And uh, I think we would assume that uh, neither of those are, uh, are true. But uh, that all speaks to the condition of the church of, uh, of Laodicea. And uh, this technology we work. Uh, again, this is at Ray Vanderland. Uh, we showed a video clip from this series a few weeks ago, uh, and this is him uh, on location uh, there in uh, West Turkey. Laodicea is a beautiful location in Asia Minor. Nearby are the great ruins of the cities of Colossa and Hierapolis, known for their springs hot at Hierapolis and cold at Colossa. To the church at Laodicea, in between those two, John wrote, I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What was it about the believers in Laodicea that led John to address them with those words, to, to portray their, their unfaithfulness in terms of hot and cold water. Could it be that there's more to the meaning of hot water and cold water than what meets the eye when you first read that verse? Today we're in a very beautiful, fertile valley called the Lycus River Valley. We're at a place where there are actually three cities. If you look across the valley, mostly north, you see the white cliffs over there. Just above those white cliffs was the city of Hierapolis. Just to the east of us, at the foot of the huge mountain that you can see just beyond, the city of Colossa. Probably most well known to us because Paul wrote a letter there called Colossians. And because his friend Philemon and his slave Onesimus came from Colossa. We're here today in the city of Laodicea. The Bible mentions that there was an evangelist and an apostle named Philip. Tradition holds that Philip was one of the Christians who came to bring the message to Hierapolis. That's fascinating in one sense because Philip came from the little city of Bethsaida. 
He was one of the first disciples from a very rural farm village. You have to imagine this guy who really hadn't lived in this kind of a world coming up that busy street. There's a fantastic gate called the Domitian Gate. It was just two gigantic towers and three arches with a beautiful gateway opening onto a street that ran from the north end to the south end of town, about a mile and a half. Really an amazing sight. Now, it was a custom in those ancient cities that your city gates would often represent the god or goddess who was the protector of that city. The gate of Hierapolis was devoted to the emperor, Domitian, one of the first emperors to call himself God. And in a sense, to enter through the gate is to acknowledge, I've come under the protection. I plan to obey the emperor. But if it was Philip, we're fairly sure he didn't do that. Because up on a hill is a small building called the Philip Martyrium, where by church tradition, Philip was remembered because he and his children chose to say Jesus is king, not the emperor. And they died for it. They paid the ultimate price for their faith. Sorry, that's kind of an abrupt ending, but again, just <clears throat> pictures worth a thousand words. Hopefully, uh, two minute video clips helps you see a little bit of what we're talking about and to see it on a map and to, uh, and to understand in context some things about this city like we've seen so far. Again, there are many churches in Asia Minor. Jesus picked seven in order to say something very specifically, and we made, a, a, I think, a good case for this really early on, that it's for all Christians for all time. It's always plural, regardless of what's said. When you get to the last verse, it's, uh, you know, hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. And, uh, and this is kind of a frightening uh, exhortation, I, uh, like I said, because we might call this church the high self-esteem church. Uh, our text will say that they thought they had need of nothing, and uh, which is kind of a frightening position to find yourself in. <clears throat> Again, a couple of things that you'll see coming to play in the text. The idea that at Heropolis was the hot water, the springs that people went to for miles around those white cliffs because they brought, theoretically anyway, healing to your body. Uh, then you get to Colossae. I think this is very interesting. Heropolis, hot. Colossae, cold. They had the cold springs that ran right out of the mountains. Ice cold water. People would walk a long ways for a drink of water in Colossae. Laodicea, you, what you get is a mixture of lukewarm, but it's got the, uh, the impurities coming with it from the springs, hot springs of Heriopolis. If you've ever been around hot springs, uh, you know that uh, they all, often, besides being hot, don't always smell too good. You get that sulfur. And so the water there, if you drank it very often, it might make you want to spit it right out of your mouth. So Jesus picks this city for that reason in particular. In terms of a metaphor and illustration, they would all get, they would all understand. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a city known for their, their cloth industry. Uh, to this day, they have still sheep there that, uh, that are, they're black in color, incredibly soft, uh, and the fabric that came from them was desired in the entire Roman Empire. But Jesus says, you think you've got the best clothing in the world, but I reject it. But I have clothing, a white garment, if you'll, if you'll come to me. Uh, the other thing about them is they were a center for, because of their location for, uh, for business, and, uh, and so there was a, a lot of banking and so forth. We've already talked about some of the major earthquakes uh, in the area uh, early on in the first century. These guys, unlike some of the, uh, the other cities, when they suffered a great earthquake, the Roman government came and said, well, we love your city and, and so forth. It's important to us, so we will fund the rebuilding of the city. And they said, no, thanks. Don't need it. We're rich. That's what they told the Roman government. Didn't, didn't take a dime. Uh, and, and all of this ends up playing into the attitude 
of these particular believers at this point in time that become indicative of, uh, of believers in, in all time, apparently, or at least it can be. The other thing about the church, he mentioned uh, Philip, at least in terms of church history, having an impact there, taking the gospel there, and, uh, and, and paying the ultimate price for it. One of the other leaders of this church was a guy we know from Scripture called Epaphras, who was, uh, spent a lot of time with Paul. Paul mentions him in, in Colossians 4.12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all, in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Aeropolis. So just to say that this church had a great start and had tremendous leadership and gifted uh, pastors that taught them the word of God. And in a very short time, within one generation, Jesus says, you're not good for anything. I know everything that you do, and it's good for nothing. In fact, I want to spit you out of my mouth. It's pretty radical. This is one of the more radical passages uh, that we have in the, uh, in the opening churches. And um, a couple of other things about them that we might maybe be able to relate to the, uh, again, the, the culture that this is setting. And we don't have pagan temples all around us, but certainly this is a, a culture that thrived on material possessions and prosperity, like ours. I mean, this is a, uh, you know, it's like, why is it so hard to reach people around us with the gospel so, so many times? It's because they're like these people, unfortunately. And we'll talk more about them. There's, there's some discussion is, are there any believers in this church or are they all unbelievers? What does it mean when Jesus says, I stand at the door and the knock? Who is he exactly talking to? Is it unbelievers or is it uh, believers? But I, I want to read uh, 1 John 2.15 because, again, uh, John talks about, the same writer, talks about this issue of being so caught up in material possessions uh, that uh, uh, it prevents them from coming to the Lord or being used of the Lord. Uh, there he warns, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he tells us what he means by that. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I think we get the idea of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. This time, the NIV does get it better because it reads this way. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The idea of the uh, pride of life means you are proud of your material possessions and how you got them. You're proud of the job that you have. You're proud of the money that you make. You're proud of the things that you're able to buy. That's our culture. That's our culture today. Uh, if, if you get around a bunch, of, a bunch of guys that are the movers and shakers and you listen to their conversations over lunch or on an airplane or somewhere else, most of it will be dominated about the pride of life. Most of what they will talk about is who they are, who they've become, they're self-made men or whatever, and they make this much, and I got a house here, and I drive this kind. It's this culture we can totally relate to. And John, the same writer, before he ever writes a revelation, before Jesus reveals this to him about this particular church, says, don't love the world and things of the world, because if you do this, you can't love the Father. If this is what your life is centered around, you cannot love God. John says, and we see that in this church here as well. Let's take a look at the text. Again, we're in Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness 
may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love are rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me to him who overcomes. I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So following our at least a similar outline or pattern from the other churches. We note first that Jesus communicates his, in this case, his character or his identity to the church as he has in the past. And he says that, in fact, he is the, uh, the amen. Now, when we say, uh, when we say amen, uh, it usually means we take it to mean it's we agree. Sometimes, sometimes in some churches, they uh, kind of get into that a little more. And uh, I, I remember one of the first trips I went to India, it was actually with the uh, Pentecostal churches way up in the north. Those are the guys that were in Bihar that were uh, reaching uh, people with, uh, with the gospel. And we were up there and uh, it was a little different because if you, if you said any, any absolute statement that the Bible is true on, then you, you got more than just an amen. You know, you could get into it, you know, because it gets a little bit like Simon says, you know, kind of a thing. You know, if things were lagging down, all you had to say is something about the blood of the lamb or something, and the place would go crazy. But uh, uh, it generally, it means uh, we say, I mean, we could say in the vernacular or right on or something. But it's more than that because, I mean, we'll use that word for, hey, we're having steaks for dinner. Hey, amen to that, brother. You know, it's like I like that, but that's not really truly what amen means. Amen means means I find that what you have just said to be absolutely biblically true in regards to God and man. It's a biblical truth that's been stated, and you're in agreement with that absolute biblical truth. And therefore, you find the word used in different places in, in the Bible itself. Now, it's being used of Jesus here. Basically, Jesus is the final. He is the uh, amen. Listen to what Paul says. This is a great passage, 2 Corinthians 1.18. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. Paul says, Everything that I've told you about Jesus Christ is amen. It is absolutely true. And he inserts that there. To the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So Jesus takes the, this uh, phrase, amen. He says, I am the amen. I am, I am everything that is true and right and correct in regards to God, in regards to man and salvation, and the, all the promises of the Bible are all summed up in Jesus as the great amen. Now, again, what is he stating here? He's stating, did I mention this? I've been absolutely faithful to you, and how are you doing? These are people that, that just go through the motions in this church. As far as we know, we don't even know if there's any believers in the church. And it's a very short time. This is a church that, that Philip, at least historically in church history, died to help plant him and his family. Epaphras, running all over Asia Minor, with Paul back, delivering letters, encouraging the, uh, this church. Secondly, he communicates the fact that he is the faithful and true witness. Now, back in uh, chapter 1 and verse 5, he is called the faithful witness... Again, uh, speaking to the fact that he is the faithful revelation of, of God. Uh, Jesus is the true witness of God. We think of uh, in John 14, 8 and 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Uh, and on many other occasions, Jesus is the true witness. What is God like? Look at Jesus. What is, again, what is God the Father like? Exactly like Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness. 
uh, again to this group of people who have not been faithful. Uh, the third thing he uh, says to them, interesting, Jesus communicates the fact that he's the beginning of the creation of God, uh, or the beginning. Now, now, Mormons and other cults love to jump all over this verse because they, they want to they say that means uh, Jesus was a created being. See, he's the beginning of creation. Uh, but that's not what it means. It means he is the originator. He is the creator. And uh, certainly we could go through lots of passages that show that. And I've given you a couple of cross-references in, in your notes. But again, uh, that's something that uh, Paul was dealing with right over in Colossae nearby. And he writes lots about that in that letter. First uh, Colossians 1.15 of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, where their thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Pretty clear statement of the preexistence of Jesus before he was born in Bethlehem, uh, and that he is not the beginning of creation in that sense. He is the originator in terms of, uh, of creation. So he communicates really his character to this church before he begins. He says, I don't change. I am, I am the amen. I have always been reliable and been the faithful witness of who God is to you. And I am the creator of all things. You think you have a lot of wealth? You think you have some things that you can rest in in terms of your, your position and moral and material possessions? I am the originator of all things that are created. Now, do I have your attention? I mean, basically, is how this thing is going as they get this letter and begin to read it. And uh, what does he do after that? <laughs> he condemns them in verses 15 to 17. When he says, I know your works, uh, now all these other churches, he says, I know your works, and then he lists them, uh, you know, that they've done some good things, but I have this against you. This is one church where he doesn't do that. He just says, I, I know your works, and by the way, they don't count for anything. They're, they're just, yeah, you're going through the motions, there, there's some appearance of religion. There's an appearance of a church, but really there's nothing happening. And so he condemns them by saying that they're complacent. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And we've already, uh, again, talked about the fact that, you know, and people speculate over this and, okay, who, who are the hot believers? Who are the cold believers? And who are the lukewarm believers? Well, the lukewarms are... People that are cardinal Christians or are they not Christians? Uh, there, there's a lot of varying opinions on this. Uh, I thought it was helpful just to see the video so you, you can stand there and see that from, from where Laodicea was, you can look across and go, there are the hot springs that people flock to. That's good. That's good. And uh, there's Colossae. Those, those, uh, in the winter, sometimes there would be a hundred streams and waterfalls pouring, uh, pouring down. And it's, well... Man, cold water, uh, that, that's a good thing. Uh, and I, I, I just think the picture kind of simplifies things. Uh, it's not, because uh, I hear people say, uh, sometimes it's like, yeah, Jesus is saying he'd rather be, have you be either on fire for him or just be a, a, a blatant non-believer and, uh, and, and live for hell. I don't think so. <laughs> I know I've heard people say, I don't think so. I think both of those things are good. And he says, you're neither one. Uh, you're, you're lukewarm. Uh, you're not good for anything. And in fact, to follow the illustration and the metaphor, I, I would spit you out of my mouth, uh, literally. And so, uh, again, and this follows with the idea of why Jesus is standing at the door on the outside of this church. And of course, it's to people's hearts as well, trying to get on, uh, on the inside. So it's kind of a frightening thing. Again, like we talked about, if going to McDonald's, you know, if going to church can make you a Christian, then going to McDonald's would make you a hamburger. There are, there are just thousands of, of people around, around the country, around the world today, in the islands that have attended church their entire lives, that go there all the time, very consistently, that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that think it's about their works or their attendance or whatever, and it's none of those things. It's about placing 
our faith in Jesus Christ. What was their problem? I have to confess that I'm a sinner in need of a savior, but they didn't need anything. They, they, were, they were, like I said, this is kind of the high self-esteem church. They don't really need anyone or, or anything. And I, th I thought about this, you know, we would, you know, so often, you know, I've had the opportunity to preach in the prisons a couple of times, and, you know, we used to go down to River a Life uh, a lot, I mean, for, for years, and, and minister down there, the folks that are, that are really struggling and uh, financially and, uh, and so forth. And a lot of them do have drug and alcohol problems, but uh, uh, a lot of them, you meet them and talk to them, and it's just, boy, the circumstances of life have just been difficult for them. And, uh, and you talk to them, but uh, the bottom line is that when you go to present the gospel and you, get a, you give an altar call, you get, you get a pretty good response. You don't really have to dwell on this thing of all have sinned and come short of the gl glory of God. None of them need any convincing of that. They know that. You know, they know that. They just want to know, but would he still save me even after all I've done? I mean, you just have to tell them over and over again of, about the thief on the cross and the grace of God and, you know, where, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Uh, you've got to really hammer that part home. Uh, but there's, you know, and then there's the other group of people that are, that are basically, you know, out there and, uh, uh, and, and they don't believe they're sinners. They, they have no thoughts one way or another. And, and you have to kind of prove God's existence and work backwards this way to finally get to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, if they're open and will think logically, there's a, a line of reasoning that you can go through to bring them to that conclusion. Call that apologetics. They still have to make a decision. It's still a work of the Spirit to draw them to faith in Christ. But can you imagine trying to reach a person with the gospel who attends church on a regular basis, does some good things, and think they're saved? But they've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ. He is not a priority uh, in their lives. They've never admitted that they're a sinner and on their way to hell unless they place their faith in his finished work on the cross. And it's only by his grace in response to our faith that then we are saved. They haven't really figured that out, heard that, come to that conclusion. Uh, so this, this is a, kind of a frightening group of people. I think maybe the most difficult to reach of the gospel. And I think that's why Jesus uses such radical language here. And again, it's not the first time. Look back in Matthew 7 as Jesus is teaching in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What's the will of the Father? To bow our knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Many will say to me in that day, on judgment day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, done many wonders or miracles in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Hey, they're not just out like, you know, baking cookies for the neighbor next door. I mean, they're casting out demons. They're, they're, they're doing some pretty hot stuff here. And yet Jesus says, I'm sorry, I never knew you. You either come to God in his prescribed manner or not. Uh, and then again, and that is by the admission of your, your own sin. And, and by the way, that means you're not perfect. So if you still need some clarity on that, just ask the person next to you. Am I perfect? They'll let you know you're not. You're, you're, you're a sinner. You've fallen short of the, of the glory of God. And so there's a condemnation for the, uh, th these individuals and this church. And secondly, he condemns the church because of their self-proclaimed confidence but you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And, um, you know, I find it just fascinating. It's, uh, you know, been around for a while, the whole health and wealth movement. And if you uh, ever uh, uh, watch any of these guys on television, which I don't recommend, but I see them once in a while, they'll, they'll make statements about the fact that it's God's will for all of us to be, to be rich and to be wealthy and so forth. And yet in Scripture, every time I read something about somebody that's wealthy and so forth, there's always all these warnings. <laughs> well, you better be aware of this, and you better, you know, and there's a real concern, you know. That, apparently, that's a very difficult position to be in uh, and to be a, a believer in Jesus Christ. These guys, hey, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I don't have need of anything. They are completely unaware of their spiritual condition. That's, that's a frightening thing. And, um, and again, it's, 
Uh, it's the person who's keenly aware of their failures in life that are, that are usually the most uh, open to the gospel. One of the things that happened historically, again, I mentioned the earthquakes, but uh, there were a couple of major earthquakes, but you could, you could understand how uh, they, they walked through those gates every day. And they said, we worship Domitian, uh, Domitian as God. And then they, they had their other temples uh, uh, there as well. Uh, one to Apollos and, uh, and different ones. Uh, they, uh, they also had the eye salve that they created there uh, for, for their eyes that was exported around the world for, uh, for healing the eyes. And so they also worshiped the, uh, again, the, the same, quote, medical God that so many of the other communities uh, uh, worshiped as, as well. But uh, uh, completely unaware of their own spiritual uh, condition. And so the earthquakes come, and their gods didn't protect them. Their gods didn't protect them. The whole city fell down. People were killed. Uh, it, was, uh, it was devastating. And, uh, but the Christians were there and say, but our God is greater than this. Our God is the creator of all gods. Uh, these are just man-made gods. You could see how there would be, a, in a sense, uh, an opening, you know, in terms of uh, people's hearts and minds for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But uh, something's gone terribly wrong here in a very short time. Third thing, he condemns the church because they don't know their present condition. How does Jesus see them? He says, uh, don't you know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? They were confident in the amount of wealth that they had and uh, no dependence upon the Lord. They didn't need him for anything. Tragic conclusion. We have need of nothing. Again, material blessings sometimes can seem like a, uh, material possessions can seem like a blessing, but uh, uh, not always if you end up in this condition. When it says that um, they use that Jesus uses the term wretched, that Paul uses that term and talks about himself that apart from Christ, I'm I'm wretched. Who will save me from this body of, of death? It's not a complimentary term. Uh, miserable, poor. Blind, blind used 52 times in the New Testament to describe a spiritual condition apart from Christ. Naked is used 15 times to describe a person who is not saved. So physically, they wore the most expensive garments you could find in the Roman Empire. They wore clothes that everybody in the Roman Empire desired to have, and, and they wore them. Uh, but Jesus says, uh, that's, uh, that's nothing. And uh, so he communicates his character. He condemns the church. But uh, I find this amazing. He doesn't give up on the church uh, or these individuals. In fact, he counsels them. And that's seen in verse 18. He counsels them to buy gold from him. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And of course, that's a familiar phrase. Anytime we see this idea of gold and refined at gold, uh, it's... Brings to mind 1 Peter 1 7. Peter says that the genuineness of your faith, that's the issue here, right? Are they really genuine Christians? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than, uh, than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that is a reference to a purified faith, not a mere, mere profession of, of faith. Uh, <clears throat> we were uh, uh, Josh has got, got us listen to a lot of country western music uh, these days and uh, Kathy went out and bought her first Randy Travis CD the other day and <clears throat> there's a, a, dinner, a song that I knew <clears throat> so everything's on his iPod we're, we're riding around and this song comes on and it was one that I knew where I've actually uh, had a good time singing it together because Dennis Agajanian sings it on one of his albums and it's a then as Agazini, and most of uh, his songs, of course, are, have to do with the Lord and worshiping the Lord or having a relationship with the Lord and so forth. He sings a lot of the older hymns, a uh, fabulous guitar player. And, uh, but he does this one love song, uh, and, uh, and so I recognized it. Uh, and uh, the song uh, kind of goes like this. Go ahead and hit the CD. No, I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> <clears throat> but it, uh, it, and I don't remember all the words, but there's a couple lines in it that kind of crack me up. But it's a song about a young guy, and and he's met a gal, and so the name of the song is Down the Road. So because he's met her, he's going down the road a little more often. 
Uh, and then the, the song, of course, country western songs tell a story. So <clears throat> it's about their relationship, and now they're, they're deciding to, to be married, and this has gone on for a while. And, and then the chorus kicks in, and of course, part of the chorus is the, the, the dad, the father wants to know, you know, is he going to be able to earn a living and provide for his daughter? But the, uh, the, mo the mother says, <laughs> and mama wants to know, are you washed in the blood or just in the water? In other words, are you really saved or have you just gone through a ceremony at some point in time in your life? She wants to know, are you the genuine, real deal? That's what she cares about. And Jesus is saying, that's what you can get from me if you come from me. You think you're wealthy, you have all the gold in the world, but it's not, it's not the gold that's been purified, the gold that will bring you into the kingdom of God. And then he mentions to buy, notice, uh, white garments. Uh, gee, I wonder why he chose this particular uh, city. White garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And certainly when he urges them to buy white garments, it's talking about uh, a righteousness that only he can bring. Uh, one of many references we could read is later on we'll get to uh, uh, in Revelation 7 of the tribulation martyrs. It is said of them, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Black wool, it's very comfortable, but it won't get you into heaven. It's only a white robe that, in this case, speaks of the purification of the blood of Jesus Christ. The third thing he counsels them is to anoint their, their eyes. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the eye salve that was exported all around the Roman world at that time and supposedly had all these healing properties. They, they actually have found out later that it didn't do anything. Uh, and I just thought that was kind of interesting given the fact that these, these guys are don't understand their own condition. They think what they have is doing something it's not doing. You know, they, they think they're okay uh, and, uh, and they're not. So the instruction here, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now they, they had the medicinal kind that really didn't do what it was supposed to do, but uh, he's saying you need to open your eyes to something different. Your perspective on life is, is very wrong. Now, in our study on, on um, Wednesday nights, going through Ecclesiastes, which is uh, very, uh, very interesting. It's, it's a little tough sledding because it's a little repetitive. Uh, we're trying to move through it, but it's fascinating in a way because it's Solomon at the end of his life. He's married all of these pagan women. He's got 700 wives, 300 concubines. He's got a gazillion kids. He's built temples for them all over the place, and he has started out so good. God. God uh, blessing him, answering his prayers, appearing to him on two occasions in terms of God's Shekinah glory uh, in the temple. He's an older man, and he's turned his back on God, and he is cynical. Man, is he cynical. He keeps saying, life is meaningless. Vanity, vanity. Life is meaningless. And I'm sure that's what these guys thought. You, you cannot turn your back away from God and think that life somehow will still be fulfilling. It doesn't matter if you've got black wool and clothes to wear and all the gold in the world or not. It just won't matter a thing uh, in, in the end. And, uh, and so much of what I think is being said here is you're going to have to come to me to really get your eyes open to see what life is really about in terms of the bigger pictures of life, of meaning and purpose and so forth. And and so the study in Ecclesiastes really is a study in worldview. And Solomon doesn't have it, but he gets it by the end, which is a good thing to know. But uh, these men and women have lost it. The fourth thing he rebukes and chastens them to repent. And uh, he chastens them because he loves them. It says in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and, and chasten. Is this a bad thing that Jesus is doing this? No, I, I, th I, I think it's an incredibly gracious thing. I'm, I'm, it's amazing he doesn't just, aren't you glad he doesn't just write us off, you know, when we wander away and when we, when we blow it. And, uh, and certainly we've got uh, Hebrews 12, 5 to refer to, and it's even quoting part of Proverbs. And, 
And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as, uh, as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So it's the fact that God will... As J. Vernon McGee says, take us out behind the woodshed once in a while is an indication that he uh, actually loves us. And he's trying to correct some false views and bring them to a point of, uh, of repentance. Uh, and that's the second part. He chastens them so that they will repent. Notice he says, be zealous and repent. Uh, it means they're, they've been indifferent to the gospel up to this uh, point in time. David Hawking says, repentance requires radical change, not gradual development. You don't just kind of repent. You repent. You say, that's wrong. I'm changing. What should I do about this, Pastor? Stop it. That's repentance. You've got to come to that conclusion that what God says is true. Your thinking has been wrong and faulty. I now repent and agree with God, and now I trust him to change me from the inside out so that my life and the repentance can be seen by others uh, as well. He says, be zealous to repent. Jesus does. He chastens them so that they would open the door. Probably one of the more familiar uh, passages in the book of Revelation. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him uh, and he with me. And, uh, and again, this is one of those issues where a lot of good Bible teachers differ over who he's talking to and what the door is. I think the conclusion is the door is the door to their hearts. Uh, again, God reaches Certainly not individuals, yeah, and that's in the language. Uh, if, you, if you open it, I'll come into him, uh, and he will dine with me. So it's to a church, but in a sense, dressed to individuals. Some uh, say that it's the church of the whole church of, of, of Laodicea. He's trying to bring life back to this church again, and certainly that's plausible. Uh, the other uh, position is the door of a believer's heart. Uh, suggesting that the believer has become lukewarm, but then that gets into the water and who's cold and who's hot and who's lukewarm. And is it a car carnal believer that he's talking to and he's trying to bring him back? And a lot of people hold that position. I, I have a tendency to uh, hold the position that it's the, the door of an unbeliever's heart. And I think that fits the overall context. We just, because it's a church, uh, we assume that at the church, it's got to be believers. I think this is a church full of unbelievers. Do we have that around today? I'll give you a list if you want. <laughs> they're, they're, they're out there. There's, there's whole denominations that don't even have, they might have a believer here or there. And I, I've met a few and it's always, it's always a thrill to know that there's still a, in that denomination a real believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, but Jesus is trying to knock at the door of the unbeliever's heart the fourth position is that um, it's talking about opening the door uh, so that he can come in and bring his, uh, his kingdom. And uh, either way, it's an invitation for, for fellowship. Uh, and, and part of the idea is that he stands and knocks. He doesn't burst the door down. There's a classic uh, painting by uh, Holman Hunt of Jesus, the king, and he's standing and, and knocking uh, at the door. And, uh, and when he showed the painting to some friends of his, uh, they pointed out the fact that he had made a mistake. And he said, what's that? He says, well, there's no, there's no doorknob on the, on the door. And he said, no, I didn't leave it out by accident. It was deliberate. You see, the handle's on the inside. Uh, Jesus only comes in if we open the door and allow him to come in uh, to our lives. If we do, then in verse 20 and 21, he promises an eternal compensation. And in this case, it's one thing. I will grant uh, to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And this simply means that, that we, again, will be invited and be part of the kingdom of God, Christ's millennial reign here on earth. Uh, and in doing so, we will... That throne represents power. We will rule and, uh, and reign with him. And again, the conclusion, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, churches, as we've kind of concluded, the seven churches, meaning uh, 
really all churches of Asia Minor, and certainly uh, these are all indications of things that were all going on in the first century and certainly continue to go on through, through all centuries until Christ returns. But again, the Spirit deals with what the Spirit says. And um, hopefully one of the things that maybe we've come to in this study is to be more sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to, to our own hearts. And we've, uh, we've touched on some uh, different issues going, going through these studies, things that were good, things that they were doing, things that were commendable, things that they were being uh, condemned for. And, uh, and again, we're not, we're not making a list but we're trying to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit telling you? What is the Holy Spirit directing you to do? What is the Holy Spirit saying? Stop that. <laughs> what is the Holy Spirit saying? Right on. That's, that's, do that more. You know, uh, Paul uses the phrase uh, of the Holy Spirit as like an umpire. <laughs> You're out. You're safe. You know, uh, the Lord wants to speak to our hearts and guide and, uh, and direct us. And again, all of the messages had the promise of the the overcomer. And of course, the overcomer from John, the same writer, 1 John, the overcomer is that person who has placed their faith in, in Jesus Christ. So again, powerful messages, uh, all seven of, uh, of them, some of them a little more encouraging than others. I think this last one, very, very frightening, very frightening. I think that uh, uh, there, there are probably, again, whole churches where there may not be any believers and this message absolutely applies to every one of them and I can certainly understand why this kind of a person would be the hardest person to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ I mean the person that has uh, problems and failures uh, in their life uh, uh, again the, the person uh, with the drug addiction uh, with the alcohol problems with uh, multiple marriages and divorces and broken relationships, uh, that person just needs to know that God is gracious enough to come in and save and will empower and transform and change your life. And if they can be convinced of that, most of them will say, sign, sign me up. That, that just sounds really a new life, an eternal life in heaven compared to what I've got and what I've been through. Are you sure this is real? You just have to convince them that Jesus is the true and faithful witness. He is the amen. He is absolutely reliable. And what he says he will do, he will do. It's not what you do for him. It's simply a response to what he's already done for, for us. Uh, the person that's out there that is the skeptic, uh, I don't even mind them. I, I, I don't mind going around the block with them in terms of creation it had a beginning and we've got to prove that so we can show that God exists and then work our way up to the point of the evidence for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ <clears throat> but the person that thinks they're saved and they're not simply because they do things or go somewhere on a regular basis <clears throat> that's the the frightening one and if that's true then there'll be a lot of mules in heaven there'll be a lot of dogs in heaven <clears throat> and you better stay away from McDonald's because you may turn into a hamburger and uh, again, it's, it's a, a frightening thing uh, because of the fact that, uh, you know, I just, uh, I want to pray because I pretty much know everybody here by name and the names of all your kids. But uh, besides that, I don't know anyone's heart. We just want to not uh, move on because uh, next week, again, General Boykin, the next week, hey, chapter four, now we're going we're gonna to be transported through the heavens and see the throne of God. And it's going to be a... A glorious thing. We don't want anyone to see it in the study and not actually reach the destination at the uh, intended time. 